Why don't we give Jesus a big round of applause instead? How about that? Dear God, thank you so much for everything you've done in our lives so far. God, if you do nothing else, you've outdone yourself already. Thank you so much for bringing us to your house. We know that though somebody might have invited us at some point, somebody prayed for us, somebody insisted, or somebody just took a chance on rejection. And we are here today because it's your grace, it's your kindness. We recognize, Lord, that some of us should not be here, but we are. I thank you because you run a much faster than, than we do, Lord. You catch up to some people, Lord, that have been walking away from you. I just thank you so much because your arm of grace is so far-reaching. Thank you, God. We also ask you right now that you help us, God, to become people that honor you, people that give you glory, God, people that not just like you, but people that become more like you, that we can reflect your love, your grace to our families, to the people around us. God, help us, Lord, to not live judgmental lives, rather lives full of grace, because we know what it takes. It's nothing out of us, it's out of you, Lord, out of what you can do in us and through us. So thank you so much for everything you began, and we're excited for what you're going to continue to do. It is in your name we pray, amen and amen. Awesome. You may be seated. I have a message uh, in my heart, and I cannot wait to share it. Uh, I want to just tell you that uh, if you're here today, um, I will pull no punches. You uh, are coming on Friday night, and Friday night it's usually, uh, we call it Formation Friday, uh, but it also happens to be life class party, so uh, it just kind of collided, and I'm like, okay, Lord, so... Is it Life Plus Party or is it Formation Friday? And I think it's both. So uh, if you're here today and you gave your life to Christ this week, would you raise your hand and wave it like you just don't care? If you gave your life to Christ this week, nice and high. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Man, you guys are awesome. A little bit louder. Come on, guys. They just gave a life to Jesus. That's amazing. Uh, so over 60 people gave their life to Christ this week through CFF. Over 60 people. Uh, surrender their life to Jesus. Some came on Friday, some on Sunday, and a bunch of people during the week in the different cell groups. So if you don't know, we have a bunch of cells throughout the throughout the cities. Uh, cell sounds super terrorist, doesn't it? Like terrorist cell. Uh, they're like, you know, they're like loving groups, man. They're, they're Bible, nah, not Bible study. We don't study it. We want to live out the Bible. It's a life group. It's a cell group. It's a cell group, all right? So anyway, uh, so it's a cell group because it multiplies because it gives life to the body. Better? Okay, cool deal, cool deal. So, um, you know, if you don't uh, know, well, now you know. So, no, now you know. So, if there's a there's a cell group near your house. I promise you. If not, we'll open one at your house. How's that? Anyway, so um, I want to open up the Bible real quick, and I want to get to Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, and I promise you, I'm gonna say what the Lord has put in my heart, and nothing else, nothing more. Is that a is that a good deal? Yeah. And the thing is this, that uh, I want you to receive this. And if you have questions, feel free to go to the Word of God. Feel free to dig in. Uh, but I want to ask you to do something, to stay with me during the sermon. I know sometimes this happens to me. I'm a little bit, uh, you know, scattered brain, scattered minded. And if something catches my attention, I go in that direction. So if you look at my phone, there's like 25 apps opened. And if you look at my computer ever, there's like, oh my goodness, like 72 like little tabs open and tabs that need to open in folders now because there's just so many things I want to keep open and store. But today, I want you to focus on one thing. And how do you see life? How do you, how do you navigate life? Like what is life to us? I don't want to get super duper philosophical, although I do like philosophy, but what is life? How do we see life? I want to challenge you today to see life as a university. To see life as a school, as something that you enroll in, although none of you asked to be enrolled in this life, to be honest. Like you were born and you were like, kind of like my kids, they didn't ask to be enrolled in school, they are in school. Now, they might have gotten a say on which school somewhat, or they think they got a sense. Now, you know, they might have gotten a say in it, but they didn't choose to study or not. I don't know, some of you guys may come from different places, but I want you to know this, that you are enrolled in the school of life. Whether you like it or not, you are enrolled in the school of life. Now, here's the crazy thing about the school of life. You cannot drop out. Now, some of you may think, yeah, I can. I can just, uh, I don't know, commit suicide. And that doesn't drop you out. It just takes you to the tension that much quicker. Your spirit lives on. You don't just stop living. The moment God gave you breath, the moment God gave you a spirit, the moment 
you began to think, you began to, <laughs> this is so beautiful, that the Lord put His Spirit within you. Think about that concept. That God decided that you'd be alive is because He had a long plan and a beautiful plan for your life. You did not decide to be born, but you can choose to pass or fail. You can choose how you live this life. And so I want to explain to you something that I believe is going to bless you, is going to bless my life as well. It already has, and it's going to continue to bless my family. But I want to share it with you, if you guys would allow it. Matthew chapter 11, 28, verse 30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. That means, come to me, all those who are tired and, he and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And what? Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me read it one more time. Come to me all who are, bare, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. For, and I and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In this life, it is not easy in this life, you will get tired. In this life, we will have moments where you will feel burdened, where you feel heavy laden. If you haven't gotten there yet, you're probably not past five years old yet. But I promise you, there are two types of people. Those that have felt it and those that will feel it. We will at some point connect with this verse where it says, Come to me all those who are tired. And I'm not necessarily saying those that want to quit or those that are just done with it. Although that also applies to you. But I do believe that the Bible is saying, come those of you who are tired of trying to figure this out and it's not working out. Come to me, those of you who have tried different things and every way you try, it seems to come up short. Now I know some of us are more prideful than others, so I'm going to go there. In this life, you cannot tap out, you cannot quit, but you can fail. And some people are really nice, too nice to tell you the truth. But we can fail at life. Nobody said amen, but it's the truth. As a matter of fact, we can fail and not even know that we're failing at life. Like, I know what failing at life feels like. I know what failing at life feels like. I know what it looks like. Have you seen the face of someone who's let their entire family down? Tell them that they're doing great at life. Have you seen the eyes of somebody who's addicted and cannot quit and seems like they're done, they're burdened, they're heavy laden and they say, I cannot succeed at this. Now others may seem like they're on top of the world, but as soon as you look behind the post, the Instagram, you know, you know that the great is not A. You know there's a reason why they must share it with everybody. You know there's a reason why it has to be out there. I don't know if you know what I'm trying to say, but even those that feel like they're doing great, unless, unless I'm mistaken, unless I'm just that weird. But the Word of God is very clear. There's three things that we all struggle with, three things that come and attack us. There's three things that we must deal with in life. And unless we deal with, with these three things, we will always come short. I want to explain to you what those things are. We all have to take three courses in this university of life. Three required courses. I remember when I started going to university and um, there was classes that I didn't want to take. Like one of those classes, could you guess what it is? Really bro? <laughs> I thought you were going to say art or something. Math. I'm a mathlete dude. I will have you know. I, I, I'm not. Okay, so I remember having to take his math classes, and I'm like, I don't want to take them, but I had to go back. And this is just low key, okay, between you and I. God did a huge miracle. Uh, I'm not even going to say it because then some of you guys think you're going to be able to be lazy and just pray and not take the test. But the Lord blessed me, and I'm pretty good at math right now. Anyway, so here's a cool thing. Here's a cool thing. I remember having to take this 101 classes. I just liked 101 classes. The first 101 class, the first, the first class that you don't get to choose, that non elective. Is the, the class of life. Life 101. Okay? Life 101. We just said that some people don't know how to live. So you're going to have to learn to live. This is why Jesus says, come to me those who are tired and heavy laden. You're done with it. Right? And I will teach you. It doesn't say, and I will caress you. And I will hug you. And I will heal you. No, it says, and I will teach you. I love that he says that. Because sometimes we think that by feeding a man a fish, 
We're doing them a favor, right? But God's not trying to do that. He's trying to teach you to fish. He's trying to say, I know you're tired. Now let me teach you how not be tired. Right? I know you seem burdened, but let me teach you how to unload, how to take that burden off. I love that Jesus goes there. He says, life 101 is not going so well. Life 101 must be taken. I don't care where you come from. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how high up in the ladder you began. This class must be taken. And I know it's hard to hear. But there is a way to fail life 101. But I got great news for you. Class is not over. There's still a long way to go. And we know the teacher. And not only that, man. We have the answers to the test. They're written. And some of you guys are like, ah, eh, too easy. Fine, fail at life. Second required course, death. Okay, this is the class all of us at some point we're going to have to go through. 10 out of 10 people die. I know that's terrible statistics for some of you. Like, what kind of church is this? The real kind where you are actually told that you're not going to... I'm sorry to tell you, YOLO is true. You only live once. You better do it right. At some point or another, the Bible says it's such a cool part of the scripture, if you really think about it. Job 14.5 says, since his days are determined, the number of his month is with you. And his limits you have set that he cannot pass. It says, since his days are determined. Like your days, don't tell somebody this right now because it's going to sound like a threat. But your days are numbered. And I didn't number them, thank God. And, and I, you know, I don't do that. God has decided. And if you're here, it's because He loves you so much. He determined that you'd be alive today. No matter what operation, no matter what diagnosis, no matter what your parents were going through and they didn't know if they should have you or not, you are here today. Amen. God determined that you'd be alive today. And guess what? The Bible says that you cannot go past that day that is determined. At some point, every one of us will have to stand in that place. One day, whether you like it or not, your face will be on a big picture. I know it sounds scary and crude for some of us, but it is true. I've done funerals of babies and adults alike. And I'm telling you the same thing right here, right now that I would tell them. It is better to be in the house of mourning than in a house of rejoicing. It is better than a funeral than a wedding. Let me tell you why. Because we come back to the reality that this life is short. And every one of us in here are like a mist that are here today and gone tomorrow. This is not to make you sad, but to make you realize what a gift we have. And one day, that class must be taken. You cannot avoid the class of death. And guess what? Some people don't know, and they're so freaked out of that one class. Because they don't realize this, that Christ has died for them. That Christ literally died in their place. Okay, I don't know if you get it, but Christ took your class. Like, he didn't take your test, he took your class. And he gave you eternal life. Am I making sense? Death is separation from God. Death is lack of love, complete loneliness. And yet Christ has stood in the gap. Christ has died for you. Class number two, check. So far, you got straight A's if you got Christ. If you don't, tired and heavy laden. But it's okay, because you can learn, not from me, not from the church but from Jesus. Class number three, and this is a required course, and it's called judgment. And I'm so glad that at one point or another, you'll hear this in a church. Nowadays, no one says these things because it's unpopular. But it is the most loving thing you and I could ever hear. Because God is not trying to judge us. To the contrary, He's trying to save us. What will judge us is our own unrighteous deeds. What will judge us is our own choices, our own decisions. You know, God doesn't punish you. Sin punishes you. And it's so wild to think about that. I don't look at my three boys. I love them so much. I don't look at my three boys and say, I can't wait for you to mess up. Like, you're, you have it coming, buddy. That's evil. And yet God is such a better father than I. Such a better dad than any of you. Such a better mom. Amen. Better parent than any one of us. What good father that his own son asks him for a piece of bread will give him a scorpion. God, you being an evil father, know how to give good gifts to your sons. How much more our father in heaven who is perfect will want to give you a perfect gift. Amen. A good gift. So what am I saying this is that judgment is not against you. Especially if you're standing on the judge's side. 
But here's the crazy thing. Here's what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For me, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. One day, uh, somebody did something and said some crazy stuff. And somebody asked me, why aren't you mad? I said, well, first of all, I don't know if they said it or not. And number two, who cares? And they're like, well, well, what if he did? And I said, well, God knows. And that God knows seemed very weak to that person's like, liking or response. But God knows it's actually a very strong thing for some of you who actually know the scripture. To understand that God knows every deed, an unrighteous deed, everything that's been done to you, and you think they got away, and they think they got away, and yet you know one day, judgment 101 must be taken. For everything you thought, even right now, everything you're doing, everything we are, we must come before the Lord and say, here I am, here's what I have. And you can try to justify it all you want, but man, you know that unlike your heavenly mother or heavenly father, you cannot manipulate him. Because he has seen it, he has witnessed it, he's been there. And that's a scary thing for some people because, and the reason I say for some people, because some people are honest. If I was to connect your head to the screens right here via HDMI, we had an update and we say, okay, we can do this now. And we were to show your life from the time you were three years old and start showing all your thoughts. Even those at seventh, eighth grade. Yes, even those at nine, tenth, eleventh. Dude, as a junior in high school. Senior, prom, we, were we begin to show college years. We begin to show the way you thought about people. How many of us can stand in front of the judgment seat and say, I'm righteous. I deserve this spot. Let me in to your heaven, God. You see, this is what the word of God says, 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Meaning the angels... For sinning, God did not spare. And we sometimes think, it's cool, man. I got it. Right before, I'm going to be like, I'm sorry, God. And I know it's quiet right now as a church, except for the children. Because you're understanding what I'm trying to tell you. But I got great news for you. That Christ has taken your sin and my sin upon himself. He literally said this, God, if it's possible, let this bitter cup pass from me. It isn't a wine cup. It isn't a vinegar cup that he was talking about. He was talking about the bitterness of your sin and my sin. He who committed no sin at all made himself a curse. The Bible says, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Jesus Christ took your sin and my sin upon himself. The Bible says that we are now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That even your righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Yet now you and I stand before God in the judgment seat right there in front of Him. And God sees not your judgment, not your, your sins. He sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? So far we got straight A's. I thought you would be happy. I'm pretty happy. I don't know if you've ever gotten the straight A's, but I'm just saying you may be used to it. I remember... A, <laughs> I remember one of my friends, I went to Arcadia High School, okay, Arcadia High School is like, pff, academically speaking, I went to play football and I was excited when I got a C plus, I was like, C plus is awesome, and then I started realizing, I got to change this thing, and when I started paying for my education, A's were a thing, man, I liked A's, A's were good, I liked A's, because I paid for the A's, it, it, tell, me the tr tell me if some of you guys understand what I'm saying, if it's free, you're like, eh, it's borrowed, but this is a beautiful thing, listen, so far, if you're in Christ, you got straight A's. And this is exactly where a lot of people stop. And a lot of churches stop. And a lot of preachers stop. And they say, check, you're a believer. You have been redeemed, and that is the truth. And it is the truth. But life keeps going. And so a lot of people stop that redemption. And so the world says, hypocrites, because though you've been redeemed... You haven't been renewed. And so your restoration has been halted. It cannot happen. Because yes, you have checked all the requirements. What about the electives? What about all the other credits that you and I need in order to get our degree? Okay, I'm going to put it like this. 
I'm not going to cover all the electives because there are so many. But I want to get to get to at least try to get three electives. See if we can. Is that okay? Yeah. Elective 101. <laughs> elective 202, I guess. Or 201. Is your way of life. How are you going to live the life that God gave you? Well, I already said I'm a Christian. Yeah, that's your status in Instagram. Now, how are you going to live that out? Okay, I have seen with my own eyes people who have master's degrees in divinities live out lives as though they didn't know one verse in the scripture. And yet I have seen new believers who have chosen to follow Jesus. And I'm telling you, they're doing it right. They're doing it right. Like, honestly, I want to hang out with them because I'm like, I think you're doing life a little bit better. Amen? So how does this work? Proverbs 14, 12 through 13 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain, and the end of joy may be grief. This is what Proverbs is literally saying. There's a way that seems right to the world, but even in their laughter, there's pain. Even though they seem so happy inside, there's pain. And the end of joy, at the end of that smile, there's grief. The Bible covers three things. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You will see these three struggles from the beginning all the way to the end. These are the three things that brought down humanity. And these are the three things that we are nowadays still struggle with. The number one is choosing your way of life in this. You must choose to not live according to the lust of the eye. What is the lust, the lust of the eye? It's possessions. Now, I am not talking about poverty. I'm not talking about lack of growth or desire for it. I'm talking about when your possessions possess you. When your desire for acquiring that possession no longer is a desire for acquiring the possession in order to bless but acquiring the possession in order to become. And that is a scary thing. The lust of the eyes, it says this, that it is that thing that grips your heart stronger than all other loves. How many people have lost relationships, friendships, family, because they had to pursue their dream? Because of what they saw. And I want to tell you this, it's very tied to the next one, the lust of the flesh, which is pleasure. Pleasure may be immediate, but joy is eternal. How many people exchange pleasure, immediate gratification. They exchange pleasure, which should happen at a specific point, at a specific time, with specific sacrifice after a specific process. And we skip the process and we desire that pressure, pleasure. And that becomes a pattern of life. When we get caught up in this area, we think we know how to live because other people clap. But you don't realize that the clap of other people are simply clapping because misery loves company. And we don't know it. And this is not for you to say, see, 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 miserable, miserable. No, no, it's for you to realize something. Either you're doing life your way, or you're doing life his way. And this is where it gets really good. You guys okay? Yeah. The next one is the pride of life, which is when people look for self-esteem above self-respect. Hello. This world wants to teach you how to have self-esteem. And that sounds so beautiful. It does. Believe me, I studied psychology, and that is what the world teaches. Even Christian books will tell you self-esteem. Yet I read the Bible and it constantly talks about self-denial. It talks about giving up your life. It talks about putting others before self. I've never ever seen a marriage succeed because you teach them how to have self-esteem. I'm doing this for 20 plus years. Never have I seen one marriage succeed because we taught them how to have self-esteem. Pastor, what about those that are broken and hurt? Yes, you teach them how to have self-respect first. When you can respect yourself, then you understand esteem. Then you understand boundaries. You see, God wants us to have self-respect. But self-esteem is this. I appreciate me. I see me. You know what? It's God's esteem. When you see how God sees you, you don't need to have self-esteem. You all of a sudden begin to realize, wait, I don't care what others say. It's what my dad in heaven has said. And that will never change. That is the difference between the ideologies of our world. But how do you know this, Pastor? It's not what I know. It's what the Word of God says. This is not new. This is not new science. I want you to know this. We are having a crisis with our young people. The young generation is having a huge crisis. If you're here today, you're a teenager. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. But I'm telling you right here. Come on, right now. 
It is so exciting to hear this. Because you're going to hear it over and over. Love yourself. Love yourself. Yes. And they will use this verse over and over. And they've never read the Bible before. But this will be their favorite verse. Okay. You must first. What? You must love others as you. Okay. The problem is that self comes first for many people. And it's so crazy. Because if I apply that in my marriage, it would wreck. It would crash. Because love is not a feeling. Love is a decision you make every single day. You know what? The crazy thing about this is that the way you live your life to a one course elective is very seldomly chosen. But rather it's chosen by culture for so many people. I don't want to sound like a militant either. That's not what I'm about. I'm not always Instagramming. I'm not always on TikTok. I don't even have a TikTok account. I'm that old. Listen, I'm not. Ah, how many push-ups do I owe you? Yeah. <laughs> ah, no. Okay, for those of you who are new, I got to. It's not 10, really? I thought it was two. All right, okay, fine. Count them up. All right. Oh, that was harder than I thought. Okay, for those of you who are new, whew, 42 is the new 20, so tell you what. I got to stop saying that I'm old because the words have power, and so I'm going to stop. Okay, thank you guys for holding me accountable. Now I'm sweating. All right, whatever, dude. I'm preaching the word to you. You're holding me over here. Anyway, I love it. Okay, cool, cool. So let's just go to the second one. Yeah, you guys good? Second elective? All right. Second elective is easy, but it's hard when you choose it, actually. Um, it's... You have to choose who the captain of your life is. Okay, so the second elective is this. You already know, okay? You gave your life to Christ, right? But here's what happens. A lot of people give their life to Christ, they surrender their life to Christ, maybe at 14 or 15 or last week. And then comes the next week when it's time to actually live life. And you're like, um, you're like that. Um, I don't have a wife like that, but some of you do. Where you're driving and, and, uh, and she's like, turn left, turn left. And like, no, not yet. There's a car coming, there's a car. You're like, no, it's like 10 feet away. Right? You're like braking and there's no brake. But you're like, there's a hole in the car already because you're like this. It's a brand new car. Tesla. It still has a hole down there like the Flintstones, right? Why? Because you got, you know, you got the front seat drivers. You guys you ever had those before? Let me put it like this. Who's going to Hawaii with us? Raise your hand. Woo! That's a lot of Hawaii people. All right? You going to Hawaii, Marquise? All right. Okay. Imagine this, okay? Come on up here, Marcos, real quick. You bringing your wife? Are you and Alexis going? All right. Let's go to Hawaii. Okay. Raise your hand again if you're going to Hawaii. Holy smoke, that's a lot of Hawaii people, huh? That's awesome. Okay, so, um, okay, anyway, so, okay, let's just say that, that, you know, there's like, I don't know, 60, 50 of us, okay, going to Hawaii. And we're all getting on the plane, right? And so, Marcos decides, you know what? I want to fly this plane. I think I want to be the captain of this plane. La, 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 la. Just kidding. <laughs> la, la, la. Okay, okay, Marcos. <laughs> Why did I choose Marcos? Okay, anyway, uh, Marcos decides, I'm going to fly this plane. I'm going to take over the, the captain's seat. So he's just waiting for him to go to the bathroom. And I could see Marcos looking at him. He's like, watch, Pastor, I'm going to fly this plane. <laughs> I'm like, Marcos, have you ever flown this plane before? Have you ever flown any plane before? Maybe. Never, ever, ever, never. Ha have you ever flown a plane? No. Okay, good, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right, even, not even an RC plane, nothing. Remote control plane, like a real one. Paper planes. Paper planes, good. Okay, that qualifies you. That's, what, that's how some people think in life, though. Like, really, I could be the captain of my life. Because I've seen it. <laughs> I saw a movie once, you know? Uh, and, uh, and, and imagine you want to take over the plane. And all of a sudden, the captain gets on to the, onto the, to the bathroom, and you just book it, right? You take the captain's seat, put on the hat, right? What do you think the captain would do to you? What do you think we all would do to you? He'll get me arrested. Yeah. <laughs> He'll get you beat up, number one, or it just freak us all out, right? Yeah. yeah. But wh why can't you fly that plane? Why? What is it about it? I mean, you're a fit man. You're a smart guy. You're an engineer, right? Electrical engineer. So why can't you fly the plane? I haven't been trained for it. Because he's no captain of a plane. That's why. He is exactly the same thing. Captain would say, get off that seat, son, before you kill yourself. For you wreck your life and take all these people down with you. We want to lead families. We want to lead our families. And we're like, 
I, I've seen MTV all my life. What else is there to learn? <laughs> what else is there to learn? I took a course one time online on how to be a better husband. Right? As a matter of fact, I got a dad. So what does that have to do with anything? Listen, exact same thing happens. We say, God, I want you to take me there. And we get on his plane. I know of we want to take over the plane. Thank you, Marcus, so much. Give him a round of applause. The saddest thing about us trying to pilot our own life and not allowing this class in our lives to actually have its full effect and not letting the captain be the captain is the trail of blood that we leave behind. If it was just you on that plane, I told you in the beginning, you cannot quit this life. Some of you who have thought about quitting, you think it's lights out, but you don't think about the pain that you leave behind for anyone who ever cared about you. And although a manipulation strategy has been used, I want you to know that the word manipulation will not hold and it will not come up that day. I've seen it so many times and it doesn't stand. What I'm trying to tell you is this, once you're on that plane, you have to allow God to be the captain of your life. Stop playing games. Stop pretending like you can get there faster, quicker, better, and take so many with you. I promise you, no matter what life skills you have, how many houses you bought, how much passive income you make, no matter what car you drive, no matter what clothes you wear, no matter how fit you are, every one of us in this place have lived only once. I don't care what other religions say, you and I are not good pilots. I have a, I have a degree, I know. You're just a bad pilot with, with a degree. <laughs> like, it's crazy how we could think that because we have earned a degree among a bunch of failed pilots, we are better pilots than the one who invented flying. Like, he is the one who orchestrated life. The creator of the universe, heaven and earth, and we somehow find shortcuts. I just want to tell you the last one, and the last one that you will choose is your destination. Say, Pastor, didn't I choose that in the beginning? No, we covered the course, but now it's up to you to choose. It's up to you to say, Christ, will you please take me to the place where you have already purchased for me? Would you show me the route? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because Jesus I have chosen to be with you. And you are with me. This is the beautiful thing about Christianity. And the saddest thing about Christianity. That Christ will not force you. He's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is not a demon. He won't possess you. He will ask. And he will come to you. And he will draw near to you if you draw near to him. I have seen this over and over The story of the rich young ruler who comes to Christ and says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, You've done all these things, haven't you? Yes, all of them to the T. He says, You just lack one thing. Surrender the command of your life. See, because the pilot of that rich young ruler's life was just that power, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And he says, Son, let it go. And the Bible says that he saddened his face, his face, his demeanor fell. And he turned around and he walked away. Scariest part in the Bible. It's not the demon possessed guy. It's not walls falling when somebody shouts. It's not even when the Spirit of God enters a room. The most awe and terrifying moment in the Bible for me is when God allows a person who has been good to walk away. That God would allow you to stay with your choice and say, you want to do life your way, dear rich young ruler? Go. And so the people ask Jesus, if this man can't get into heaven, who can get into heaven? He says, this is why I'm telling you it's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they look at him and say, what? And he said, but with God, all things are possible. This is why Jesus is not talking about finances. 
This is what Jesus is talking about. What is your riches? What is that one thing you draw value from? The one thing that you say, this is who I am. This is what gives me weight and worth. And God says, no. This is the eye of the needle. The, the little door where the camels would go through. And it is small because it's meant to protect the city. And if a camel was to go through, they had to unburden themselves, take all the load of, and barely fit through. Listen, it is impossible to go into the kingdom of heaven without the king. I cannot just enter the White House and say, I know Biden. No, I don't. I'll get tackled and beat up like Marcos at the airport. Right? I know that. But if I'm the son of the president, we have a different story now. Here's the crazy thing about this. You and I, well, I don't know about now. Anyway, just, but what I am saying is this, listen, here's the crazy thing. I know this is the one thing that some of us in here don't consider. That God loves you so much, so much, that some of you are on strike 54. Strike 56 now. Some of us in here are like, man... I just came because I heard there's cute girls. <laughs> and God is like, I still love you so much. Like, I love you so much. Your heart seems so far from me. And you're so close right now. It is that simple to say, God, I don't want my destination to be what it was. I want my destination to be with you. Right next to you. Amen? Last, and we leave with this, I promise. The gospel is simple. You repent from your sin. Repent sounds like a religious word. All it means is this. I'm on going down the 10 freeway and I repent from going down the 10. So I, instead I turn around and I, instead of going east, now I'm going west. Going towards LA now. I repented from going that way. It's that simple. Repent is change your mind enough that your attitude and actions begin to be impacted. Repent. Repent. Pastor, I don't know if I can. I know you can't. That's why you have the Lord. That's so why you have the Holy Spirit power. We've seen people come through these doors who are so broken. You know what I love? That God doesn't come to the healthy. He comes to the sick. Amen? He comes to any one of us that say, God, I need you. Because the miracle of resurrection only happens with those that are dead in their sin. Repent. The second thing is have faith in God. Instead of having faith in your goodness... In your sales skills at life. You think you can get through it. Not in this one, I promise. This university will beat you to the ground. And as soon as you say, God, I want to walk with you. Teach me how to do life your way. I'm tired of being tired and heavy laden. Teach me. Show me how to do life. Enter the course of life. And the moment you do that, it's called having faith. Now, faith for some people is a cheap word. Because they think it's just believing. No, it's believing with all your weight. It's believing with everything you have. It's saying, God, I will have faith upon faith. And when everything seems to be opposing it, I'll still have faith in you. It's not faith in God. No, it's faith in what God has said to be true about my opinion. And anything else that may seem to make sense at times. Because what you say matters most to me. That is faith. The third thing is easy. And it seems a lot easier than others. But please listen. You repent. You have faith. And you confess. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And you will be saved. That is not Pablo Martinez. That is the word of God. He says you believe in your heart for righteousness. But you confess with your mouth for salvation. And that is what the scripture says. Nothing more. Nothing less. Now. I want to pray for anyone that wants to surrender their life to Christ. That wants a new captain in their ship. That says, God, I want to live a life according to you. After that prayer, we're going to open up something called life class. Today is an exciting day. Because life class, as opposed to just coming to church, which is wonderful. Life class is all about teaching you how to walk in this life according to the scripture. Not according to Pablo 101 or CFF 101 or Christianity. It is what does the Bible actually say? And if that correlates with a Pablo, the scripture, I mean with the, with the you know, Christianity nowadays and the church, then that's fine. 
But the Bible comes first. What does the Bible say about you as a parent, as about you as a wife, as a husband? How do you read the scripture? Do you have a devotional life? What is a devotional life? I'm so glad you asked. It is going to the Word of God every single day. I mean, we open Instagram, we check comments, we check what people say. What do we say? What does God have to say today? That is a devotion at the end of the day. God, I will be devoted more than the gym to you. I will work out my salvation. Right? And that is what you learn in life class. You learn how to forgive. You learn how to walk in freedom. You learn how to worship God. You learn how to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Life class begins next Friday. Next Friday, you will see Ewani and I will be spending time away from our kids and putting it into the children of God. We want to invest into your life. The leaders in this church have been so excited for this. We've been fasting and praying for you. One hour for four weeks, then we go to an encounter. Some of you never heard of that word. An encounter is something where we go Friday, Saturday, come back Sunday. Too much commitment. I know you're not ready. That's fine. But for the rest of you, it's simple. That week is the time to turn things off. To say, God, I just want to be away with you. I want to heal. I need to heal. You know, sometimes you just need to sit down and receive. Because you've been giving life all the time. And people keep demanding and demanding. And it's time to say, God, I want to have a face-to-face -face encounter with you. You know, I was a Christian for a long time. But it wasn't until I had my encounter that my God changed my entire life. My existence was never the same. My wife was so sick. She had hypothyroidism. She said she couldn't have kids. She was losing her hair. Depressed. She could tell you her own story one day. But the Lord healed her at an encounter in such a beautiful way. Amen. I'm just excited because I got a wife with hair. That's amazing. That's really cool. Depression has no grip whatsoever in that woman's life. I'm not kidding. It's like she depresses depression. Like what? <laughs> it's really exciting to see and to see her help people through that. It's such a beautiful thing. Encounter is forgiveness. Encounter is freedom. Encounter is having vision for your life. Encounter is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. After that, we finish with three more lessons. And if anyone wants to get baptized, we'll do it right here. Right on that baptism in front of every one of you. Now understanding that this is a process. Process, process, process. Life is not a picture, it's a video. Amen? Many little pictures put together. Amen? Here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to stand up with me for a second. The real gospel should redeem, it should renew you, and restore you. If it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, it should redeem, which is save you, buy you back. Number two, it should renew you. If it's not renewing you, it's a cheap, watered-down version of what it should be. I want to tell you this, and I pray it sticks with your heart. If you brought somebody new today, I'm not going to apologize to you because they needed to hear this. Some people's gospel does not work. Because they have taken it the way that a fool takes antibiotics. They take it halfway. Huh. They only take three, four. I'm good now. I'm, I'm solid. I'm good. I'm good. Look. Woo, woo. My back don't hurt no more. My fever's gone. I'm happy. And your bottle's still half full. Everybody's like, hey, you got to finish, man. No, I'm good. I'm good. You know what happens after that? You don't take the full dose. You know what happens? You guys don't know. I know. It gets way worse. And then that antibiotic, it has to be way stronger. You cannot stay with that. Now all of a sudden, that virus has adopted, adapted. It has morphed. It has literally mutated. It has said, oh, you got, that's all you got? Now I know how to beat you. And it gets stronger and better. And next time you hear that, oh, that antibiotic don't work. And you're like, no, well, you don't work. You don't know how to take it. You were disobedient and you thought, oh yeah, it's not Jesus. What? You mean to tell me that this guy that was dying and took it with obedience is now alive. His family is restored. He himself is a living proof. And you are still struggling with the flu? Why? I know flu doesn't take antibiotics, doctors. But I'm just saying to you, the gospel is the same way. 
take the gospel. You don't try it. You either take it or you don't. When you're ready to take it, take it fully. If you really don't, you're not tired of being tired. I don't want to push you. This is not about an emotion. This is about a decision. The same way that I tell people, the moment I decided to marry that woman and she decided to marry me, there was no going back. It wasn't like, hey, hey you want to try this? Yeah, okay, let's try it. Let's try it. I mean, you like me, I like you, you're right. No, it was like, you know what? Till death do us part. And that is a relationship with Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Let's pray two prayers. First prayer. A surrender to life, a surrender of life to God. God be the captain, be the pilot of our, of our journey, of our lives. The second prayer will be, God, help me to get better at life. God, help me to learn from you. Close your eyes, let me pray. If you are here in this place, you came on your own accord but not on your own strength. You're here because God has given you the strength for one more day, one more chance. I don't want to invite you now to receive the greatest love of all. The one who will never leave you, will never abandon you. The real Jesus, the one who loves you so much. The one who gave his life for you. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrated His love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the moment where you choose. And you say, Jesus, I give you my life. Would you say with me? And I'll lead you through it. But make it yours. It's beyond a prayer. It's a confession. With faith. With intent. Would you tell Him, Jesus Christ, in this day, I surrender my life to you. God, I am tired of doing things my own way. I ask you now to forgive me, to change me, and to make me the person that you want me to be. God, I want to walk with you, and I want to work with you too. Dear God, I ask you right now to give me the faith, the courage, and the patience to do life your way. I give you my dreams and my nightmares. Give me your life, God, and I give you mine. Now let me pray for you now. God, I thank you so much for this beautiful people. I thank you, God, because today has been an amazing night where your word is preached, but more than anything, you, Holy Spirit, have planned it all. I ask you right now for anyone who's been struggling in life, God, that today we can come back to you the pilot of our plane, God, the one who commands the waves of the sea and the winds, the one God who spoke this world into existence. God, we trust you. We turn back to you. Today, Lord, we say to you, God, help us to do life and do it right. Help us to do life according to your ways and not the world. Lord, we trust you. Would you help us teach us? If you're here today and you're struggling with that, with your eyes closed, I want to encourage you to think about this. Sometimes we can be really hard on ourselves because we're not doing that well in some areas. But I just want to tell you that no one has taught us. No one taught you. My father passed when he was too young and I was only two months old. I didn't know how to be a father. So I had to go back to the Word of God and go back to the Father in Heaven to learn and still continue to learn to be a dad. I cannot beat myself for that which I don't know. I could only recognize it and learn. So this is a time now where you ask God to give you the strength to learn, to give you the strength now to forgive yourself at times and to move forward and to continue to grow and to continue to learn to do life, a life that glorifies Him and that honors anyone that comes near you. Dear God, we love you so much. Thank you for life class, God. Thank you for, for this amazing, incredible, beautiful ministry, Lord. That will not just leave people at the altar, but God will walk with them through life. Thank you, God, 
because I know that there's people that are going to sign up today and they will learn to love you and walk with you, God, and that will remain with them for the rest of their lives. I thank you for the new beginnings that are coming up, God. I thank you, God, for the redemption, the renewal, God, the restoration in their lives. God, I thank you, God, for all that you're going to do in life class. Thank you, Jesus, so much. Give us the wisdom, the God. Thank you. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all that you're going to do, all that you're doing. Thank you for life class, God. Give them the strength and the courage to remain with it, to stick with it. In your name we pray. Let's worship God one last song.